timing. Howdy, Marty Groman here. Uh, thanks for joining our E2 Tech Connects today. A little intro from me about who we are and uh, what we're up to, and then we'll hand it over to Baskar and we'll be talking about uh, uh, our topic today. And yeah, Riley, thanks for hitting admit there for me. So 308 member companies, woohoo, and 400, uh, almost 5,000. Um, we're Maine's largest energy and environmental uh, network. Uh, it's not even close. And uh, connecting people and being um, conveners of discussions. It was funny, we were just, uh, Riley and I earlier today, we're looking at uh, an E2 Tech uh, mixer that was held almost exactly 10 years ago. And uh, we've been doing this a long time. Um, actually, our 20th anniversary will be coming up in May. And uh, it's, been, it's been really great to be able to make all the connections that we have. And that is my job. I right now have a, uh, a company that has kind of a legacy old steam boiler system and wants to upgrade to a, uh, a cogen system. And I'm helping them make a bunch of connections in the energy and environmental world. That's a good example of the kind of thing that I do. And uh, everything we do is free for uh, students and public officials. So uh, that's important. What we do not lobby or advocate at E2Tech, and I always like to make that point. Uh, I won't, you won't see me going up before the legislature or writing a letter to the editor that says we're for the power corridor or we're against it or we're for aquaculture or we're against it or we're for offshore wind or we're against it but we will try to put together discussions on those topics that are even-handed and have both viewpoints and ideally uh, lead to some type of, uh, of good outcome and making our events free for public officials so they can attend and, and witness or be part of that discussion is one of the ways that we do that. We are also uh, helping to advance the diversity of our community of almost 5,000 professionals that I mentioned by working to welcome new Mainers to that uh, pretty intentionally and uh, uh, off to a reasonable start here and have, I would say, more work to do, but we are focused on it. And we're also really pleased to be uh, working with the Maine Technology Institute. We've got a great connection with them. And uh, if we can help you with your new project or idea, new product line in the environmental and energy space and get that ramped up and find support within MTI's network, uh, including funding, mentorship, uh, uh, building your business out from the ground up or adding a product line, that's what we wanna do. And we'd be happy to make intros. None of this happens without our sustaining leaders. Uh, these companies, Bernstein, Schur, Con Edison, uh, Con Edison Transmission Power Market is a community solar company, uh, SMRT Architects and Engineers, obviously uh, builds a lot of large healthcare facilities, but also built the uh, Rue Institute campus in Portland, and Burns and Mac, uh, which is one of the nation's largest uh, inter environmental consulting firms make all of this possible. And we thank them and all these companies make all of this possible as well. Uh, sometimes in the, in the world of, uh, of uh, nonprofit sponsorship, you call this the shield. And I like that because it's, uh, these are the companies that make what we do possible that support our work all year round. And they believe in advancing the sector by advance, uh, by, uh, supporting E2 Tech and TRC and VHB, uh, environmental consulting leadership uh, companies uh, sponsor this event and all of our events all year round. And if you'd like a free print subscription to Maine Biz, uh, let us know. You'll get a form after this event. It's nice to get Maine Biz uh, in the mail and it's kind of old fashioned way, but it's a great, great resource. Uh, it's amazing what Maine Biz covers. And uh, because of our promotional affiliation, uh, with them, uh, we can get you a free subscription. We've got some good stuff coming up on March 2nd, which is, uh, I think, uh, just not, not quite two weeks away. Uh, we are, it's meant to be kind of a, a joke, but the civil side of solar, not that the solar industry is uncivil, but if you've seen one of the large solar installs, maybe you've driven along Route 2 in Farmington, 
and seeing that 490 acre install up there, um, you, you know, you can only see a small part of it from the road. Well, there's a bunch of those coming this year. You, it'd be, you might see 30 of them and uh, not all that large, but what does it really take to do those? And, uh, uh, you know, the site work. So this is going to be an interesting forum. And then uh, you probably know Spencer Thibodeau, former Portland City Councilor, um, real estate attorney, and uh, all in all interesting person. He is uh, going to be presenting in this exactly the same format in three weeks. Uh, he's now at the U.S. Department of Energy and has uh, a lot to bring to us. And then something we really want you to know about Clean Tech Open, we are uh, affiliated with them as we have been for many, many years. Probably the best known example of a company that has uh, gone through, worked with the Clean Tech Open process as part of E2 Tech is Pika Energy, now, now Generac. And uh, we are looking for many companies, more companies like that. And if you have um, an idea for a, a Clean Tech Open company, this is a national uh, clean tech accelerator, could be biofuels, uh, bio industry, biochemicals, energy, energy storage, you name it. I, as shorthand I kind of give for this is this is uh, a quick introdu introduction to the Boston 128 loop tech hub. And um, uh, it's a great chance for E2 tech members or non-members, thanks to MTI to participate uh, for free. It actually costs, uh, uh, $1,350 to be part of Clean Tech Open and get that mentorship and co coaching, but MTI covers that. So this is, yes, damn it, another Zoom, sorry. And uh, we want this to be participatory. We, we um, and this is not really the right slide to be participatory because it's so dry, but we, we miss those hallway conversations, right? And uh, this is what this is, meant to be about. It's a new topic that one of our members knows a lot about, and we can start a discussion. So Baskar will lead us on an intro to the topic, and generally people leave questions to the end, but if you want to jump in, uh, either in the chat or turn your camera on and, and engage, that's great. It's This is really kind of meant to be an informal digging into a topic, and um, Baskar Mukhopadhyay has been very good about coming to E2 Tech events, and uh, we finally uh, got him to speak. He's got an amazing and interesting background in consulting at Deloitte and PricewaterhouseCoopers, and now has his own uh, his own company in this field. So um, let's hear from you, Baskar, about uh, what you see in the renewable energy space and how uh, blockchain can be part of the answer. Thank you, Marty. Let me- Absolutely. Thank you. Get to share my screen. And- Looking good, working looking well. I just want everybody to know, I got my Inc. 500 thing here and I cannot ever get that thing straight. So if, if that's bugging you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey look at that it's working it's working all right yeah. take it away Vasker. thank you thank you so the topic is really blockchain based solutions for smart grid i broke up the agenda into two parts and really want to talk mostly about how blockchain based potential notable use cases and under various scenarios can work but before I can get to those scenarios, I think I ought to really give everybody an understanding as to why this may be the right time to talk about where the uh, energy grid is and why is it just the right time for it to pick up uh, blockchain-based solutions. And um, in some ways, energy industry could be a laggard in picking up internet type solutions and blockchain-based solutions but time has come. So first, let me try to explain why, and then we'll go through how, and through a couple of scenarios, I'll try to see if I can uh, teach out what 
the principles are of building these scenarios. And then hopefully, uh, once we are done here, you could probably build some scenarios for your own uh, neighborhood. But uh, uh, let's get started. The first thing uh, that, and before we get started, let's, let me also talk about, a little bit about why. Uh, the why that I want to achieve is that there is a lot of talk about decarbonization, decentralization, other things, transition from the traditional grid to the smart grid to smart grid 2.0. What I want to really get to is that smart grid 2.0 is built on what is called the energy router and also built on an internet structure, which is called energy internet, but very much, very similar to uh, the internet of things or internet of devices. And once we get to understand what that internet, energy internet is or internet of devices or internet of things, we can quickly understand how blockchain can morph over it and then get to the scenarios. So starting with the headlines, I think lots, uh, these days, a day wouldn't pass when somebody's talking about renewable energy resources, cyber attacks, transmission losses, and grid modernization. And you'd probably also hear in the news about uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, Bitcoin hitting 60,000 uh, and so on and so forth. Very seldom do you actually hear about uh, blockchain doing something with the energy grid. And maybe the time's going to change. Uh, so just going back to what are some of the requirements and trends, and most of you know the three Ds, which is decarbonization, decentralization, and digitalization. And pretty much decarbonization, which is low energy, leading to an integration of a lot of variable renewable energy resources, which actually uh, doesn't make it like a source to uh, consumer it becomes a very distributed uh, kind of situation with distributed energy resources, advanced and small scale technology, technologies. And that leads to a very decentralized structure, uh, not somewhat very similar to the internet structure. And to fire it all up and to make it cohesive to work all together, we have digitalization, which will bring advanced communication, metering, some increased connectivity, along with some cybersecurity type uh, techniques. Uh, but it will be remiss on me if I totally miss out that while this is all happening, there is a big notion about grid resilience. And I know we had the Texas situation. We had situations where, um, <clears throat> You know, where a tree fell and got the entire grid uh, grinding to a halt. Uh, so that's one side of grid resilience. But on the other side, I think the customer behavior has been evolving. It's been evolving in every industry. Uh, customer is king. But it's been evolving in the um, grid area because uh, gone are the days when they are rate payers. They've kind of morphed into consumers and maybe more presumers, meaning producing and uh, consuming energy at the same time. So we need to keep all these together and see what is evolving. What's evolving here is a, a three-step process. We've hopefully moving away from the um, conventional grid and um, moving to smart grid. And the smart, smart grid is kind of uh, reflected by um, more or less uh, two directional flow of information. And I know this slide is a little bit uh, eye chart, but uh, there are little arrows with red lines that shows uh, bi-directional. But the main information that I want to really get to is Smart Grid 2.0, which has these blue arrows, which is arrows of bi-directional flow of energy and information. It also has these little cubes, which is gray cubes. Those are the, uh, what is called the uh, energy routers, which actually works very much like routers in your home, where you direct the different wireless instru uh, instruments to connect, your laptops to connect. Here, we have uh, that allow us to have bi-directional flow of energy. Uh, I do also have on the left-hand side top, uh, a 5G, 
showing that many of these equipment are wireless, 5G, metering, et cetera. So you get the sense that this is enabling bi-directional flow of energy and information. Moving to the next one, uh, it's an eye chart, but really all I want to get to from this eye chart is that we're moving from the traditional fossil fuel to a smart grid 2.0, where we're probably 25 plus percent plus on renewable energy resources. In some cases like China and Norway and the Nordic countries and Denmark, they're probably reaching 50%. And if you looked at the same stat, probably by 2030, 2035, many countries would be there in their 50%. So what else is happening with this movement? Uh, the challenge is seamless integration of not only the energy resources, but storage. And I know batteries are coming into play, but that's an interesting part. To make all this happen, we are having some infrastructure changes. And not only have we had smart metering system for a while, but the smart energy routers, which will be the advanced power uh, sources that will make the, uh, the power uh, bi-directional. And uh, finally, uh, we will get a proper two-way flow of energy and information using, which will, uh, which we'll call uh, energy internet. And I have another slide to kind of show you how that uh, builds up. But before I leave this eye chart, I do want to say that a lot of things are getting automated, but that also means that we need to build in uh, some automated uh, elements around resilience and reliability. And that's why we're probably going to be looking for self-healing. Can we route the energy around? Uh, so on and so forth. Um, getting to the next slide, this is where I try to uh, connect that we have um, we have always had in other industries Internet of Things. So it's Internet with lots of uh, diverse devices sitting in different areas, and there is this technology that connects it. What we are starting to see is the growth of distributed generation storage, prosumers, EV charging, smart devices, cyber physical system, and that little diagram out there is kind of showing that we, this is a tremendous growth of lots of small little devices. So the challenge becomes dynamically integrating and controlling many of the connections and transactions. And I kind of shaded that in yellow. And that's where the IoT technology that has evolved in other industries that we can use here. But we also have some other challenges around traceability, transparency, security, privacy, and disintermediation and programmatic trust. And that's the part blockchain is going to be able to bring. I do, before I leave the slide, I do wanna uh, bring out two other elements. One is the internet thinking is customer's king. We have kind of seen that uh, in all the apps and uh, everything else that's uh, being delivered to the customers. And the internet business model that makes the customer king is sharing resources. So when we added internet and taxi, it became Uber. When we added internet and banking, it became Venmo. And if you're thinking, when we add internet plus energy, we have probably some question mark, and this may be about to change. Uh, let me kind of uh, drop back and maybe some of you have understood what blockchain does um, on an internet structure. The starting point I want to uh, start with is that internet is a set of code, and maybe it's a seven layer code, and blockchain becomes the eighth layer. When you put the eighth layer, you are able to disintermediate and put programmatic trust in it. So again, if you see the little structure that I have there. Um, <clears throat> but the other point that I want to really make here is that for quite some time, we have always flowed to a situation where we take friction out of the system. Now, it's very easy to understand. In mechanical system, we had wheels, ball bearings, and we took the friction out there. In electrical engineering, well, we kind of took uh, the resistance out. In information sharing, 
we have been taking that friction out in stages. If you start on the left part of the chart, you had your old mainframe uh, computers that was very painstakingly, you had to kind of uh, get back to the central computer. Then we morphed to the, <clears throat> to the decentralized uh, client server base. And from there, we moved to the network or distributed system, just like the internet. But at the internet, we had this peer-to-peer -peer structure, but we still continue to have a central institution take care of uh, as intermediaries. What blockchain does is allows you to take that intermediation off, which means it takes uh, friction out of the information system, but it also takes uh, friction out of the financial system. And that's pretty much important to understand because what you're really going to remove, if you take the banks or clearing houses as intermediaries, you will no longer have to wait for a transaction, banking transaction, which shows pending for a day to kind of close at the end of the day, or you trade stock, it's almost two to three days before that is cleared. So that's where we are attending. Uh, one more slide to talk about blockchain before we move on. So what is blockchain really solving that internet could not solve? The biggest thing on the left-hand side is what it's really solving. But I would stop and start with the bottom one, which is double spending. And double spending is to make sure that you don't utilize the same digital currency, make multiple copies and spend it multiple times. On the right-hand side are some additional qualities that blockchain brings along with immutability, triple entry accounting, disintermediation, very important to remember that and tokenization. So tokenization, as we understand it, the dollar sign for cryptocurrencies, gold for assets, IP for uh, like major artwork being sold as NFTs and so on and so forth. And maybe we can add some energy grid coins, maybe a main coin that allows you to do trading on energy systems. And that's probably the idea that I want to set in your mind before we move to the next area where we talk about use cases and, uh, <clears throat> and scenarios. So on the use cases, uh, we probably have a number of use cases and scenarios that we can build around electric e-mobility. And this is probably going to <laughs> explode uh, with Biden announcing $7.5 billion last uh, week and uh, with the idea of building a charging station every 50 miles. Then there's grid management with all these renewable sources, disparate sources distributed in many multiple localities needs a whole sign of demand and supply management. And blockchain can bring that. Uh, the third item, decentralized energy trading is very important. And the way I would start is that if you go back to the concept of friction and taking friction out of financial systems, you not only take friction out of financial systems by taking intermediaries away, uh, reducing fees like irritating banking fees, or moving or uh, reducing the time to settlement, you also uh, take the friction away by creating incentives. And energy trading creates incentives. And that's probably something you need to think about as everybody is building these different scenarios with energy grid. And energy trading can come in multiple varieties. Uh, we always had energy trading, even within traditional um, grid, where the major top 10 or 20 um, companies traded amongst themselves. But what this is going to do is that you will be able to trade peer to peer, meaning with your neighbors. Advanced metering and billing is a, a pretty good uh, place. And not only can we do metering and billing, we can even make payments because you're on the blockchain and you might have a main coin or a stable coin or something else that you can utilize to pay. Another area would be green certificates, carbon trading, very messy to keep track of, put it on the blockchain. And lastly, you have the IoT, smart devices, automation, and asset management. This is pretty much the internet of things or internet of energy or energy internet. This is how to bring all, to, all uh, together, keep track of it and 
a distributed system like blockchain can do. So with that, let me move on to the first scenario. And the first scenario that we are going to build is a microgrid on a private blockchain network. And this is how we start. We can probably start with your own neighborhood. I live in Holden. It has 3,000 occupants, maybe 1,000 houses. Each house becomes a node and is able to connect in a virtual plane along with the uh, power grid uh, as well. And each house or the location and the computing device that gets on the blockchain is identified as an asset and put on the chain. So how, do, how does this all work? Let's move to the next slide. And in this slide, let's say we are a small subset of the Holden. This is Holden Hills, the six houses that sit, uh, sits in, on my neighborhood. The house that has a little yellow sign on top is on the east. It gets most of the solar energy in the morning. The houses on the west actually do not, but what can happen is that they can have a transaction and I have a yellow arrow saying, let's say we move one main coin or a token to the house on the east and buy electricity that is being generated during the morning hours. And that can actually reverse in the uh, <clears throat> afternoon and it can go the other way around. And this way, what you're doing is that you're buying and selling energy and you're trying to keep the energy within a small locality or within the microgrid. So what this is helping us do is a fully decentralized microgrid where the prosumer participates in a peer-to-peer -peer trading and any surplus en energy can be sent out, sent, can be sent out to the bigger microgrid. It can be sent out to the overall grid per se. And we are kind of using this peer-to-peer -peer trading, but there are various variation in what trading can be. And again, I'll just go back, think about what is the incentive. And this is the incentive that you try to give in the virtual layer while the transactions are happening, uh, the energy transactions are happening in the physical layer. So there are two layers. And the last remark I wanna make is that P2P markets has shown that the, if you do have these uh, energy peer-to-peer tra -peer transactions happening, almost uh, the self-sufficiency metrics and self-consumption metrics <laughs> goes on almost uh, twice. So uh, two times, and this is probably a readout from a Swedish project back in 2019. There are similar projects happening in Brooklyn, in the heart of Brooklyn downtown. Uh, so there are multiple places where this is happening. Uh, the part to remember is uh, make sure that the uh, P2P trading and the incentives are really aligned with how they should work. I want to dive a little deeper to give you a little more flavor as to what's happening within the house. So here at the house, and what I'm drawing here is a schematic for an energy router. Uh, you can see that on top, the solar energy flows only in one direction. Uh, probably there's an inverter and then it switches to all the other uh, uh, equipment, laptops, cars, etc., that are using the energy. You have a storage, energy storage, which is bi-directional. And then you have a connection to the power grid or the microgrid. And I have a little uh, <laughs> yellow uh, sign for a switching. So you can switch on and off. And, and But I want to drive a little further on the energy router for you to see how do we achieve the bi-directional energy flow and the bi-directional uh, flow of uh, data and how this can be uh, minutely controlled. And not only will we help uh, the prosumers, but we will help the grid itself in demand and supply uh, type of uh, machinations to make it all balanced. So this is, and let me start on the left-hand side where you actually see the grid. The grid has a switch. Uh, I put a smart uh, meter there. It's 5G, so you know it's on the wireless area network using the latest technology. Uh, right now it shows it's open. It flows 
its information to the energy router. The energy router is the hub. It actually becomes the node on the blockchain. So the energy router is flowing two different sets of uh, information. The red information is uh, the information on what's happening with the meters. The blue information are really control uh, signals. So if you start from the bottom, you have a photovoltaic gen generator. It, there's an inverter. You have a, a blue input, which means it's being controlled. It goes up to the power meter, and then you can understand how much of um, power is being pulled into this uh, into this small area, uh, into this small section, uh, and uh, used used up. The next one is um, a battery energy uh, storage that also has a, a modulation and uh, and a controller. Similarly, uh, there are two for load controllers. One could be just simple loads. The other could be, you know, smart loads. And so this kind of gives you this energy router is going to be the pivotal point as we morph into uh, the, um, the smart grid into a smart grid 2.0 with blockchain. Now, the next slide actually wants you to kind of understand what is it that we are trying to do and is there a framework of this cyber physical socioeconomic architecture of the energy internet and let me start with the bottom bottom is the physical layer this is where the power flows this is the physical network this is the resilient infrastructure we then go on top which is the cyber cyber layer this is really where the data is flowing in, uh, data is flowing out of the metering data, control signals are coming in. There's a whole slew of computation that's happening. But the middle layer, and maybe I should have taken the middle layer and put it on top, but that's the economic layer. That's where the blockchain is. That's where the energy trading is happening. That's where we can actually bring a lot more policy and regulation that we haven't even talked about. How about giving a special incentive through a token to a certain uh, backward um, rural uh, area in Maine. So those that area of the economic layer or the socioeconomic layer is a place that needs to be designed. And when you're looking at the slide, you really probably ought to stop and think, what is really happening here? What are the scenarios? What is the ingredients? And the ingredients is really electrical engineering in the physical layer, computer science in the information layer, and a whole slew of uh, economics and uh, um, game theory in that uh, third layer. Together, when they make the perfect alignment, that's your solution. That's the scenario we want to go for. How do you all put it together? Can we do it one state at a time? Can we start with what CMP and Versant is doing and Floyd downwards like we have done for the last century? The answer is not. That planning could not go, it will probably not go that well. The way I see this happening is I see this happening one microgrid at a time. And where I would start? I would start in islanded community in both ways. It could be an island. It could be the Swan Island, the Deer Island, the Isle de Alt, which is on uh, the other side of Stonington where they try to be self-sufficient and when they want more energy or they want to switch out of the grid, th there's, there's a little switch there uh, that you can see that they can uh, get out of. The next thing would be to take the lessons learned and, and leading practices and best practices and try to capture uh, far-flung neighborhoods or rural areas, maybe in Algash or Rangeley. And I have very little knowledge of the state, but I'm uh, blurting out and hopefully I'm saying the right um, places. And that's where you build. From there, you come to what are the place then universities and industrial campuses? University of Maine, Orna. Uh, you know, how about they become a captive center? How about they become a design unit? How about they trying to pull it all together? And universities have done this. It has happened in San Diego. It has happened in part of Urbana Champaign in Illinois. And it's happening across the globe. 
And then finally, I would come to building smart cities. And it's taking that same concept to one city at a time. It could be Portland, it could be Bangor, but it's already happened in Dubai. It's happened in the entire, um, <clears throat> entire country of Estonia. There has been pockets that this is being uh, built. So my idea is let's not plan the whole state at a time. Let's start with little pockets, little microgrids at a time. And then this will be an evolution uh, if not a revolution, and it'll it'll float up. And in the middle of this, I think the prosumers will probably be a very key element of this happening. Uh, that brings the first scenario. Hopefully you have some ideas there. Um, I will quickly go through the next few scenarios. Um, the next scenario is very important, smart charging. Like I said, Biden's trying to put uh, one of these smart chargers every 50 miles. Let's say you have 100 such smart chargers in the state of Maine. What we would do is we'll take one blockchain, but we'll create different nodes. And the nodes on red will be the smart charging nodes where the charging stations and the EE or the, electro, uh, the electric vehicles that we are driving as users will be the green nodes. And the structure below kind of shows you multiple cars having charging stations. So that's the infrastructure that we need to build. So how do we make this all happen and not end up that every morning, everybody wants to charge their car while they're getting out to work. Uh, so how we do this it, it is done in really, it, this is one of the ways, there's multiple ways you can do this. One of the ways is that if all the 100 charging station gets a quota of energy in the morning, but Somebody says, you know, well, today I don't need this much or today I need more. So what happens is that within the charging stations, there is a blockchain based uh, quota uh, trading, which kind of utilizes a, a double act auction type of thing. And that graph kind of shows it. If you have more time, we could talk about it, but that's, but once you use that, that double action type of quota and all the charging stations are ready, then comes in the electrical vehicle. And the electrical vehicle goes through a four-step process. It looks into the blocks and chain and says, oh, you know, what's happening? What's happening with the different charging stations? So it's almost like you get, get a, in the morning, you're driving and you think, well, you know, the Chevron station, which is five miles from now is expensive. If I drive 10 miles from now, that cert might be a lot cheaper. It's the same scenario here, but it's done through a blockchain there'll be one to N or one to 100 stations. Everybody will bid. The bid will get consolidated. In three, you will kind of uh, look while you're driving on your iPhone, which will be an energy wallet. You will get a feeling, well, if I drive five miles, I have this charger, but the, uh, they're going to ask me this kind of uh, rate. If I go 10 or 15 miles, uh, it'll be less, but can I drive that much? Or should I fall back and charge uh, than my car uh, at night. So this is a charging scenario. What I want to do next is I want to bring another scenario, which is very, which probably all household will face. This is the metering, billing, and payment. So what really happens is that you have all these uh, smart um, meters and they get all pulled in. But in, what we are using here is a, a consortium version of a blockchain, which means it's a private blockchain. Uh, it, not everybody does mining in it. I know one of the things that we all talk about is that uh, proof of work, which is a consensus mechanism. Whenever that is utilized, uh, you uh, the uh, for the Bitcoin, you could almost uh, use up uh, more energy than what Nepal or some of the smaller countries use. So. Uh, this is delegated proof of stake, which is a different consensus. I just wanted to put a variation out there. What this does is that it, amongst the nodes, you have some accounting nodes and a master node. So the accounting nodes read these meters, create a uh, consensus, drop it in the blockchain. The blockchain moves up to the grid operator. The grid operator can send out the billing. And also, if you're on the blockchain, why not use some main coins to pay for it? And, but that information is not only sent to the grid operator, but it's sent to CC, which is the control center, 
and they can using that deploy a lot of demand type uh, machination on the grid uh, and it can send to uh, producers where a lot of maintenance type of things can be uh, uh, <clears throat> could be scheduled so the the part that uh, happens here is that you mitigate the risk uh, from an attack on the user power usage data centralized you're not faced with the centralized data storage but it becomes on it comes on a blockchain so you kind of avoid some of the security problems but the benefit which is in green down below uh, you can pay uh, pay in stable coin like me coin uh, main coin or some other coin uh, and it uh, and you take the a lot of friction out of this payment and billing cycle uh, let me move quickly and i know we need uh, need to leave some time for questions this one is just a, a technique that is used for cybersecurity. And what you really want to do is in cybersecurity, one of the major problems in the grid is that you have the problem of in, uh, injecting false data. And to avoid that, you, the, the structure here is two sets of blockchain. One set of blockchain at the bottom of the picture, which, is, which has all the meters. The next set of blockchain is called on the fog nodes. Fog is something that sits on the edge of the cloud. And then the, our uh, control center is sitting in the cloud. Um, moving on, this is to kind of expand the idea saying you can have a blockchain for energy trading. You can have another blockchain existing for electrical vehicles. You have another blockchain for putting all the demand and supply side and everything else happening in the microgrid. And then you can have another blockchain to take care of all the cyber security problems or cyber physical security problems. And you can expand this even further. You can put all the wind into one blockchain, all the solar across the state in one blockchain. So it's an expanding way. And like I said, I wanted to give everybody a feel of principles of how they can design this going forward. One last scenario. This is pretty much every time you, in green, you have a renewable megawatt of energy generated. You have a certificate which goes to a person that uh, an industry that is utilizing from the power pool. But just because that industry holds the power, uh, the certificate, it becomes green. It's a little messy. A lot of small uh, generate generation companies are, uh, are cannot get into this mix. So what better than put it on the blockchain, have trading happen in the blockchain and then go to the ultimate user. At this point, I'll stop for questions. Oh, before I get to question, one last challenges part. Uh, there's a lot of challenges uh, that are probably getting taken care of uh, in, in the area of blockchain protocol. And these are being solved in other industries. So we can pretty much uh, pick up as they succeed. It's a maturing te technology. It's difficult, somewhat difficult to scale. There's a problem with transaction speed, but that's improving. Uh, there's a problem with interoperability of different blockchains, but you know, if you design it well, that will work out too. Uh, there's always a problem with whenever industry is uh, deploying a new, in, um, a new, uh, a, a new um, technology. So standardization is a problem. But the bigger challenges are, how do you have policies at the municipal, at the uh, cities, at the state level, so that you are aligned? How do you come up with regulators who understand what is happening and that regulation is aligned? How do you create governance, both within the blockchain sector, uh, um, section and outside? And finally, 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 I wanna talk about incentives because it's the right incentives in that socioeconomic layer through trading, through option, through main coins, to mileage plus uh, scenarios that will make all, take the, uh, take the friction away and build a, a lasting greener solutions and for state like Maine. I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Basker. Really interesting stuff. We've got a ton of questions. One of the ways that I like to uh, just promote a little engagement with this uh, sort of 10 or 12 minutes that we have, if you're willing, yeah. pop your, uh, turn your camera on and I'll do a, a, a smiling screenshot. So I find that smiling is a good way to get, to get you to, uh, 
to get people to open up because I will call on you to ask your questions if you're willing. And actually, Barack, since you popped on first, I, I'll probably have you ask your first. So if you're willing to turn your screen, uh, your camera on for a sec, I'm going to uh, I'm going to grab a screenshot and I will do it here in a second. Thank you. <laughs> All right. One, two, three. Thanks, Bernard. OK, I got gotcha. you. Uh, Barack, you had a good question. Uh, you want to start off? Sure, sure. Hey, Bhaskar, thanks a lot. I mean, this is this is a fantastic presentation. Really exciting ideas. So, I have two questions. One of them is is I mean, just do you foresee this type of systems being built as private blockchains or on public blockchains? And the second question was like, I mean, as as we discussed earlier, like I'm I'm, I'm a big helium, uh, you know, participants, and and I was wondering whether you see those type of models where. Uh, you know, uh, like a helium-like company coming in and building augmented systems to the to the national providers, like like helium is doing with five G. Do you foresee those type of initiatives, those type of companies popping up in the in the energy space? So the uh, the answer to the first question is fairly easy. It depends on the industry and what you're what you're trying to achieve. And because you're in the energy grid industries and the players are not like across the globe, they're in your neighborhood and they're known to each other, you would really start with not employing a per, uh, you know, permissionless public blockchain like uh, Ethereum, even though lots have been uh, designed on Ethereum itself, but uh, it may be expensive, but it might be a lot more manageable to do it in, on uh, like I put that example of consortium blockchain, which means you could have a consortium of uh, uh, or a federated blockchain amongst a consortium of stakeholders and uh, build your blockchain. And at least for starters, that should be the way to go. You may, if there is a lot of acceptance on any one platform, then we may morph into a, a permissionless, but definitely not the way to start, not the way to start in energy, if I was answering this question for banking, I would have a different answer. The second qu uh, question is, I kind of talked about uh, renewables like uh, a wind turbine and solar. And the reason the wind turbine and solar is uh, good is because there are metrics and the metrics is that the per unit uh, you, um, cost of generating wind turbine is falling, falling, falling. And then, so when that metrics fall through a, a pivoting point, then it, it, it becomes a way, then the next uh, challenge becomes how do you pull it within the grid in a distributed structure? Same answer is with helium or wave technology or geothermal. It all needs to, uh, the metrics that you need to look at is what is the cost of producing that. And as they drop, it will be easier to pull them in. And it'll, and if they drop a whole lot, then you can have what is called virtual power generation thing units where you can link five hydrogen units across the uh, state and then have one blockchain and pull it and sell it. So it's all possible. And I just love because we are getting into distributed uh, computing, we can draw lines and connect anything across the internet. So, yeah, okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Robert, I think, Robert, you have kind of thematically similar question. Yeah, Marty, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, Baskar, this is Bob Cleves from Portland. I'm with a company called Dirigo Solar. So, I'm really interested in this, and this is a super helpful presentation. Um, I think my what gives me unease is that I get excited about the technology, but so much of what we do in energy space involves, you know, centralized entrenched bureaucracies like EPA um, and or or ISO New England. And my concern, and I just I'm wondering if you share it, but but first I want to give you an example. My concern is that the technology is so far ahead of of government institutions that this could take years to adopt. So let me give you. Let me give you a concrete example and have you react to this. So, and probably a number of you on, the, on this call are familiar with this. So renewable energy credit trading in New England is um, managed by 
um, the, the ISO uh, GIS or generator information system. And it's a centralized system that essentially matches or validates production of electricity with the attribute, uh, the green attribute. And then that green attribute is put on the system and is sold to a third party. Highly centralized, highly bureaucratic, uh, highly inefficient, and really favors large producers as opposed to someone with a solar panel on their roof. So like, what is it gonna take for um, ISO or EPA or the state of Maine, for example, to embrace what you're talking about? And it's a very good question. And actually I have kind of debated myself quite a bit, but when I actually came up with the slide, which has three layers and the, the layer in between, which was, uh, I believe, green in color, I called it economic layer, but it's really a socioeconomic layer. Even though I put the blockchain as an incentive for peer-to-peer -peer trading, but that layer also contains the policies, the regulators. And we have a century worth of centralized designing that has happened. You're not going to be able to remold it in one day. So just like I'm saying that you have to come up with a building and re, uh, redesigning or in some ways re-enhancing microgrid by microgrid, you almost need the legislators to start thinking that if this is the evolution that we need to have, it's going to be microgrids, it's going to be the university campuses, it's going to be the smart cities, then how on that a green layer or the socioeconomic layer, do my policies need to change? Do my regulations need to change? So that is that is the question that you're really asking. And you're absolutely right. That is not a technical question, but that is a question relevant to us. And it is part of the framework. It is the third layer on my framework. It's a tough one. Thank you, Bob. Um, there's a, I want to go to Bernard here in a second, but uh, and Susan, I don't know if you want to pop on. You, you ask a question about, uh, uh, I'll just pose it here, but uh, certainly welcome you to. When you using, when you use the term incentives, are you referring to price signals? Absolutely. When I, incentives, the ones that I've given you examples are all price incentives. So when you're doing peer to peer trading, what you will realize that if you're trading with your own uh, neighbor, the price will be a lot less than if you traded with the microgrid and it'll be a lot less if you traded with the grid or the DSO or the transmissions uh, you know, um, uh, operator. So, and those tradings will happen in multiple layers. So it, the more, the trading obviously happened in the wholesale market, but those prices never came down to the prosumers. What you're trying to do is you're taking those price signals and trying to bring it into the neighborhoods. The other place where price signals are important is the smart charging place where I get it, where the smart charging uh, uh, chargers themselves have some kind of a trading going on. And, uh, and it's a double auction to come up with the base price. And then individual users have a choice of where they will go and uh, fill up the charge or wait till the end. So these are all price signal uh, economics that we're using. There could be others. There could be incentives like the state gives and we come up with the main coin and the state gives that, well, if you're trading uh, within amongst yourself or you trade with this microgrid, which is in rural, we will give you one main coin. It's almost like giving you United Air Miles. It's that concept, but put it on the grid and put some money there and it's going to happen. I love this main thank coin you. idea. Go ahead, Susan. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. It was a good one. Uh, um, this is good, a big one here, uh, Bernard. Um, yes, first of all, Bashkar, Bash thank you very much for the presentation. And it's very, very useful and very eye opening. Um, it's a good transition because um, I'm involved in a project in France that is distributing tokens. Um, distributed through blockchain uh, based on um, carbon reduction, but not participating into the carbon credit uh, system, but distributing as an incentive to uh, decentralized use of uh, energy. And we've started with biogas and we're doing 
green electricity and green hydrogen. Um, one of the things, uh, challenges we faced was um, in terms of using the blockchain system uh, was actually the, um, the carbon footprint of the blockchain system and how much information you do, uh, you, you do integrate in the blockchain system. And uh, I give you a very simple example. We're going from the field to the, let's say the bio digester or the bio refinery to the distribution to the tank of the biogas um, uh, truck or car. And, and being able to determine how much of the uh, life cycle assessment information we integrated and integrate in the blockchain and how much of the IoT provided information in the bio is actually a challenge in terms of data storage and data management on the blockchain. So my, in short, my question is, how do you look at the footprint of you know, running uh, blockchain-based distribution systems and decentralized systems? Perfect question. And actually, whenever I have to provide solutions on blockchain, whether it be to the banking industry, whether it be to put supply lobster on the supply chain, whether it would be to put uh, you know, immunity passports for COVID. You always look at a blockchain in four layers, and I'll give you the layers, and I'll tell you what how it applies here. Obviously, the bottom layer is the infrastructure layer. Right over that is the blockchain protocol. That's the question. I, I think Burak asked me the question: Do I use a permission one, or a public one, or a private one? So that's the question. Now, the question you're asking is. Do I use a blockchain with proof of work, which is very in energy in incentive? And if anything, we create a green out of the green energy renewables, we'll lose it because of the Bitcoin blockchain or other proof of work. So the thing that is used there is delegated proof of stake, which is probably not the most, uh, uh, most convenient one or the best case scenario. Because if I wear my auditor's hat, which I was a financial auditor, it's the, there are some problems that I see that there. But from a utility and tactical point, uh, DPOS or dis distributed pro uh, uh, proof, uh, proof of stake is a way to go. The next layer above, and again, this is my consulting hat, is the data layer. And what do I look at the data layer? In the data layer, I have to make a very conscious discussion and decision as to what do I keep on the chain or what do I keep off the chain? And if I keep it off the chain, how do I pull it back? So these are all excellent design questions. I probably didn't delve, I mean, this would take me a lot more to delve into this, but these are things. And then, then above that, you get to the process layer. That's where you decide, you know, what's happening with the process again. Yeah. But consulting but that's methodology that's in one, one minute that's or two very minutes. difficult to, to put the, um, uh, to choose exact, exactly the right balance, especially when you're trying to build actually what you are calling a main coin, where actually we're creating like local coins for people to actually use local energy generated by waste in the local area. And so in order to get individuals on board, uh, there's actually a, a further obligation to be is, even more dis disclosing even more information, but you have a limit about what you can really like handle in terms of footprint. Yeah, it's perfect. So prove my point on uh, incentives and making yeah. the incentives local. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And I like that this is moving to action too. I in uh, in, in Bernard and Baskar, if you're not connected already, I'm happy to make that happen. Uh, Baskar, thank you. Uh, everybody, a virtual round of applause. Uh, very well done. Great discussion starter. Slides will be coming. Great upcoming events. The civil side of solar, you've seen some big solar projects. You're about to see 30 plus more this summer. How do those actually get built? And uh, the, in everything from the site, the site work, uh, really interesting. Spencer Thibodeau, former Portland City Councilor, really interesting guy. Uh, now works for the U.S. Department of Energy. Come hear from him in this exact same format in on uh, March 10th. And Clean Tech Open. This is maybe the developer of Maincoin will go through Clean Tech Open. That's an, an actually an excellent example. Uh, World class mentoring in the Clean Tech Open, all covered by the Maine Technology Institute to develop that next company. Jobs, 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 jobs.
jobs on our board at uh, at E2 Tech and upcoming events. I swear we're going to have some in-person fun. Our 20th anniversary is coming up in May, and uh, we're going to be getting together uh, in person. I hope you'll be able to join us. Thank you again. Slides and recording will be coming. Oscar, great job. See you soon. Have a wonderful afternoon. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.